five second count. Okay. okay. Uh, five seconds. And we're on the middle camera to start. Okay. Hi, welcome to the CA TV show. This is a show that we interview a lot of guests. And we have privilege this week to have Dave Norman, who is the author of a book called On White River Junctions, Empires of the Floor and Steel Ambition. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, nice to meet you, Bob. Thanks for uh, having me. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's, before we get into the book, yeah. let's talk a little bit about you. Um, right. Okay, um, tell me where you're from. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, metro okay. area, okay. and I came to live in Lebanon across the river right. in 2004. I was a master's student up at Dartmouth for a couple of years. Well, awesome. Yeah, and that's when I fell in love with the Upper Valley and specifically right. with White River Junction. I okay. just really love this part of the country. Right. And um, so where are you living now? I live over in Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine, yeah. So. Well, my son goes to school in South Portland, Southern Maine yeah. Community College. Oh, there yeah. you go. Right he, across the bridge from us. He loves Portland. Cool. It's a really nice city. Um, so anyways... You have been here, and everybody falls in love with the Upper Valley. And yeah. one of the, the towns that has changed the most is White River Junction. Absolutely. I mean, it has changed. And I know I did, my students and I taught did a, a video history of mm. White River, the Hartford area, but a lot on White River Junction mainly. Um, so what, whatever inspired you to do a book on White River Junction besides you just like the Upper Valley? It was one of those things that just developed organically. Specifically, my interest in the area started one night in about 2004, late fall, early winter. I had had a few too many consecutive meals at the Salt Hill Pub over in Lebanon. And it was kind of late. I wanted dinner. I didn't want to deal with dishes. I'm like, I'm just going to drive somewhere and find something new. So I jumped in my car, hit the interstate, and every exit sign from New London up to Montpelier says, so many miles to White River Junction. <laughs> like, White River Junction? Okay. Next exit, White River Junction. So I take the exit. I'm like, here I am in White River Junction looking for something cool and new and different and hip to eat at 8.30 p.m. on a Tuesday. And in 2004, there wasn't anything open at 8.30 on a Tuesday. Right. So I parked, I went to the tip top, not the tip top building, the Hotel Coolidge, and I asked, you know, what's going on here? And she said, well, nothing is going on here. It's 8.30 on a Tuesday in White River Junction. I said, well, where can I get some food? She said, tip top building. Maybe the cafe is still open. Now, so what, year, what year is this? This is uh, late 2004, okay. early winter, late fall. In okay. That and I walked, I remember walking up Main Street, right down the middle of the street, not disturbing any traffic because I was the only living thing outdoors, mm. as being really impressed by all these gorgeous old buildings. Like this must have been a happening place you know, at some point yeah. in the history. This was a really important town, judging by the buildings, but something happened and it isn't that way right now. And I started wondering about that. And I walked into the tip top and of course everything was closed. They were mm. sweeping out the cafe. But seeing the way the walls were painted, all the art, the sculptures, everything there right. was really powerful to me, really impressive. And I got the sense that this was a town in transition. And I wasn't sure what it was coming from or what it was going to. I just got that sense of an energy right. in transition. And so I read a little bit about it. You know, as the days went by and the weeks went by, I read more and more. I met Matt Busey, who is the owner of the building, right. and did all the amazing renovations on the yeah. space. And he told me, what he could in kind of conversation about the history of the building. And I just fell in love with the idea that uh, one family and one business empire could really be so much of a microcosm for the history of this particular right. town. And so the more I read, the more notes I started taking, and eventually I started turning those notes into writing. And yeah. After a while, I had a book out of it. Well, we, CATV, moved in here around year 2000. Okay. In Tip Top. Um, we actually had that space a while, and then I can't, here was, yeah. it used to be a, a furniture. A Holmquist furniture. Holmquist furniture used yep, to be refinishing. here. Refinishing. Right, and they moved out, and we, we took the space for, for the mm. studio, and I can't remember what year it was. I think it's 2005, around okay. there. Just after I discovered the building. Then. Right. That's why we did it. Yeah. We knew you were going to do a show here. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I remember quite a bit, of, I grew up in Norwich, I live in Norwich, and I've been here since 1981. Cool. But it, the change in White River has been. I mean, I think a lot was the sales tax in New mm -hmm. Hampshire affected a lot of the shops that are here where, no, mm -hmm. where there were no, no sales tax in New Hampshire, sales tax in Vermont. Yeah, I was talking to Larry Chase, who was uh, one of the state representatives in the 70s, I believe. Yeah. And he said one of the things that he tried to work on was the differential in business taxes that businesses in Vermont were taxed on their remaining inventory as an asset. Whereas in New Hampshire, apparently they were taxed differently or not yeah. at all. 
So uh, like you said, in addition to even the sales tax difference, there's more behind the scenes business taxes right. going on too that made it really difficult after a while for businesses on the west side of the river that dealt in you know, tangible, uh, valuable goods right. to really make a go of it compared to their competition across the street. Right, and you know, I remember, I remember the change in White River the last five, six years. It's been, it's been outstanding. I mean, yeah. and it's become an artist community, different shops that opened up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's still the Polka Dot Cafe there yep. as a tradition. And uh, unfortunately, just over the river, which has always been a 40s diner, Mm -hmm. Closed, but I guess they went by and there's lights around there, cars there, so maybe they re reopened. That was the first diner yeah. that I came to in the Upper Valley right. when I was looking for an apartment. Four Aces. Four Aces, yep. Oh, it's a great place. It was really yeah, interesting. Place, yeah. yeah, and the little uh, out, yeah. yeah, the jukebox is right there on the table. Yeah, some's broken. You know, end up playing with four or five songs after a while, but it's great. <laughs> um, and of course, one of the things that you know, uh, established White River Junction from every it is a junction where the mm -hmm. two interstates co mm -hmm. can converge together. But also the trains. Exactly. Um, the trains, you know, as we're here, shoot, we're shooting out at 2 o'clock, but if we're here at 11 o'clock, around 11 o'clock, the Amtrak will come through mm -hmm. and you can hear it. The Vermonter. The Vermonter, yep. right. And so, one thing about the trains, tell us a little about the, maybe the use. I know you started writing, I believe, 18. And the 1870s is right. when the narrative you really writing, picks up for me. Yeah. Right. So, tell us a little about the history of the, of the trains through the, through the years. Um, the or stations in an area, yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. So the, the trains uh, came through here in the late 1860s with the survey crews and all of that, yeah. and the first tracks, I believe, in the early 1870s. Yeah. And by that time, all the survey crews had come through. People really were getting the message that yeah. the trains are coming and started speculating what that could do for their businesses. Yeah. And what that did was, in effect, build White River Junction as a major rail shipping empire. Yeah in the late 18 early 1900s, as it did for a lot of other formerly small towns throughout New England, throughout the rest of America, too. One of the ways that it really shaped the downtown air area is that uh, you suddenly had a way for farmers to get m more inexpensive supplies in from other towns, shipped up on the rails. So you had businesses go in and uh, right down downtown White River, where the two rail lines split off. Uh, the Central Vermont Railroad, uh, B&M lines going north and south, and the spur off to the west where it's Queechee and all of that. And the farmers needed businesses that could help them get supplies, you know, seeds and fertilizer and machinery from other places so they didn't have to produce everything locally, and to get the excess of their crops out to other markets. So suddenly they could produce more than just what their families needed and what the local area could absorb commercially they could produce excess and sell it to other places and turn that money into reinvestment and buying more right. land and clearing more trees away and cultivating right. even more. So we see an expansion of the agriculture in this area and we see an expansion of the businesses that were already here, some of the lumber mills, some of the early paper mills that were uh, up and down the rivers. Now again, they could get more machinery and supplies more inexpensively right. shipped in on the railroad. And they could make more paper than what just White River Junction needed right. and the Hartford area needed. So you see this tremendous business opportunity. And people started getting the idea in their head that there, there was really something to this whole railroad shipping concept, mm -hmm. which then was pretty revolutionary, kind of like mm -hmm. I imagine the interstate system was a revolutionary concept for my grandparents. Yeah. Like the idea of personal flight may be revolutionary someday if we all get helicopters. <laughs> right. now, who knows what's coming next? Right. But so this, you know, that in, there must have been a lot, lot more businesses here back in the 1870s to early mm -hmm. 1900s than there are right now. I, Absolutely. I mean, obviously, it's funny because a lot of public access stations. There's 24 in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I would say almost a good half of them are located next to a train station in a exactly. building like this, mm -hmm. because I imagine when the train started slowing down, the buses came up, automobile planes. Mm -hmm. Most businesses moved away from the tr railroad station mm -hmm. and moved out and further into, into different areas. Yeah, our country really became, our, our city planning really became decentralized with the advent of the new transportation technology. Right. And when I look at the history of White River Junction, I break it down into three major epochs. You have the prelude where it was the territory of the Native Americans. Right. And the first epoch that I really look at is the junction of two rivers. And the yeah. title of my book, White River Junctions, I, I pluralized it right. for the different types of junctions that came up through the era. First, the rivers, and then we have the intersection, or the junction, right. of two rail lines, and then the junction of two major interstates. We have 89 and 91. Yeah. 
And when you look at the development of the town, first from kind of a uh, river stopover for the log driving men, and, uh, lumberjacks, right. bringing the lumber down the rivers, and the barges bringing livestock up north, then you see the railroads coming and stopping for the night back before they had anything like right. headlights. Yeah. They actually had to stop for the night. Mm -hmm. And so in all of these little New England towns, you see a nice old hotel, if it's been lovingly preserved anyway, you, right. you'll still see these old hotels, right. like the Hotel of Coolidge, that was right along where the trains would stop. Because come dusk, they had to pull into the, the town on their schedule to stop right. for the night, right. and everyone had to get off the train, go find some place to stay get back on the train the next morning after breakfast right. at a local diner or a hotel or whatnot, and the train would continue on. Uh, you know, I grew up in Rutland, Vermont, okay. which is about the other side of the state, but it's also a big railroad town. Mm -hmm. And at that town, the skiers came. Okay. New York City, they, in New York area, they, they, had to, they came into Rutland and skied to Killington or Pico and the cool. other areas there. Uh, so the trains emerged, and you know, they still, you see the freight cars come by here. They sometimes stay forever here. You mm -hmm. hear clanging and everything. You feel the rumble in the walls. The rumble yeah. in the wall. And I know we have we did a show with a person named Chris McKinley. You might want to get in touch with him. He's taken okay. some beautiful pictures of mm -hmm. the trains coming through here. Yeah, I actually interviewed him for. Um, oh, he did. Okay. Yeah, the opening chapter of my book. Okay. We stood there on the platform, and he told me all about the different sizes of trains that yeah. came, and how they would count the uh, big driving wheels in the rear, and how the uh, numbers like for the four nine four broke down to be, I believe, four driving wheels, nine of the guiding wheels, and four uh, wheels under the tender, I think mm -hmm. is how the number 494 broke yeah. down. Uh, Something along those lines. He's, of course, the authority on that. Right. <laughs> but you don't seem to know the characters, too. I mean, I think... Oh, yeah. And then you see some of the, the people out here. I mean, I, man, that's really, that's really great. Mm -hmm. Also on White River Junction, there also, I mean, before your book was there, I mean, the junction, one of the famous stories was that um, Rogers Rangers mm -hmm. came through here. Right down the river. Down right? the river, yeah. and their bolts tipped, and all their muskets, mm -hmm. weapons fell in the water. And the story goes that Dartmouth College found them mm -hmm. years back, and they're hoarding them in their college. They won't let me see them, which, if that's true, is too bad. So, so the college is hoarding an arsenal of muskets somewhere muskets. in the woods. That's a rumor has it. <laughs> they rumor found, has they found it. in the river, and they're probably in their, in their library somewhere. That's the rumor. So and Neither confirmed nor denied. denied Dartmouth College, did, arsenal you, you of muskets. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, uh, up, if you go up right there, there's a, uh, if you know where Dunkin' Donuts is going on Route 5 mm -hmm. North. I do. There's a famous grave there. Okay. And uh, we did a video on there. Evidently one of the founding fathers or founding person or whatever mm -hmm. is buried in it. It's a, it is a, a tomb, sort of. Okay. And then you see, you can open the doors. So if you drive by, go right River Junction, mm -hmm. by Dunkin' Donuts, and take that meteor right toward, toward the fire the police department, mm -hmm. right on your left, you'll see that tomb. It's still there. Interesting. And it's still one of the founding father, one of the key people yeah. in Hartford is buried there. I gotta check that out. Yeah, so if you go up there after this, um, Grab a coffee or whatever. It's right there. But actually, you get right into Dunkin' Donuts as you okay. drive through the drive through is right there in front of you. And I, you know, I might just pry it open and find you Rogers might. Rangers muskets could, right that's there. Maybe that's where it is. Well, it sounds as do not touch property of Dartmouth College. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll break the news right here. Yeah, I know. So. We can do that. And um, it would be exciting. I mean, yeah. Um, I was at Jamestown a few years ago, and uh, my son, and the day before, they discovered a 400 year old gun. Hmm. And we went the next day, and they were so excited. Um, they think probably someone leaned against a well and it fell in. Yeah. But anyway, in Hartford, there must be some interesting characters. There have definitely been some yeah. interesting characters. Yeah. And we're talking about, we're talking about characters and some buildings. Yeah. But characters, one character that I keep hearing about and I know nothing about, but yeah. every time I go somewhere, it's like, Dot Jones, Dot mm. Jones, Dot <laughs> Jones, Dot Jones. And I say, whoa, I, you know. So I hear her about her, but I don't know who. Is Dot Jones and why is she so important to, to Hartford? Well, she served as town lister for a good number of years. Uh, she was born at the family homestead just west of here yeah. on, I forget the name, I think it's, it's whatever the analog to 14 is on the north side of the road. Okay. Might even still be 14. Yeah. But anyway, she was born in the family homestead out there and raised with her uh, brother who went on to have an illustrious career in World War II as an aviator. Yeah. And she told me that he taught her how to play basketball out there in the barn. Yeah. And when he was serving World War II, she'd play basketball out there and, and just think of him and hope for the best for his yeah. safety. And she says, you know, he flew 56 missions that went spectacular, not a problem. Wow. It was the 57th that got him. 
Uh, he was shot down over in World War II behind the lines in uh, occupied France, I think. He was a prisoner of war, and so she told me this story is about this man, and she built him up to be such a great person. And it sounds like he really, truly was. And it, it was later that I learned more about her role in local history, her role down in Bellows Falls, oh, yeah. where she was first a gym uh, teacher and then a guidance counselor, that I realized that here I, I sat in the living room of a woman who told me about this great man. Yeah. And you told me about these great people from the Upper Valley and these yeah. great Vermonters. And she was herself one of these great people. Right. But she never brought any attention to it herself. Yeah. She was really humble that way. She had awesome. a quiet power about her yeah. that was really cool. And she'd yeah. drive, I believe, her Cadillac. And <laughs> she had her pipe, and she'd have her pipe and drive her car through White yeah. River Junction. Everyone would smile and wave. because yeah. she, Just about everyone knew her, and she knew just about everyone here. Yeah. Did her brother survive? Uh, he survived World War II, he was a prisoner of war, uh, yeah. came back, ended up becoming, I believe, the Air Force's analog to a brigadier general or okay. so in uh, one of the reserves. Awesome. Yeah. Now, who's His story is in there a little bit more minor than Dot's, of course. I mean, do you have any interesting quotes from her you'd like to read to us? Or? Uh, not that I could find, just okay. real quick. Real but oh, One of the really neat parts about Dot Jones's life in Vermont mm -hmm. is that she uh, was born and raised here in White River Junction area. Yeah. Then she went down to teach in Bellows Falls, spent some summers down in North Carolina, worked a couple summers over in Maine, yeah. but came back to White River Junction and always had this tie back here to the land. But while she was down in Bellows Falls, and this is what I was really interested mm -hmm. in about her life, she said that she really stood up for women's sports. And I said, mm -hmm. what does that mean? She said, well, there was, was a women's basketball team yeah. there at the high school that could use the gym occasionally and no one really went to the games that much. So she set about to turn that around and get equal time for the girls' gym basketball team and then a community basketball league and get more female involvement there. And this was in the 60s during the women's rights yeah. the movements and cultural revolutions where the idea of a women's sports team getting equal time as men was kind of revolutionary. Yeah. Where the idea of women's sports getting equal recognition as men's was revolutionary. Yeah. To Dot Jones, it just yeah. made sense. She right. was a gym teacher and wanted her girls to have a chance to practice yeah. and be as good as they could be. Awesome. And so I saw this woman who was a, kind of a revolutionary women's rights figure who didn't see herself as that at all. Didn't really seem like the front lines of any protest kind of yeah. person. And yet here she was actually having an effect and making kind of big changes in Bella Fa Bella's Falls culture for women's sports and for high school level sports in general. I think a lot of people come like the idea of coming back to Vermont. A lot of people do. My son yeah. is in Portland right now, mm -hmm. going to school in Southern Portland, Southern Maine, Southern Portland, right? And um, he wants to come back eventually. I, mean, I think people definitely come back to Vermont. Yeah. Uh, which is good to see is actually some of the younger people come back to Vermont because Vermont, mm -hmm. I'm sure, is an older state. Uh, so, what some other interesting characters you met, you could talk about in your book? Uh, Joe Pogar, one of my really, really good friends up here in the Upper mm -hmm. Valley. Uh, he made it to 102 years old, I wow. believe. He just passed away last fall, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But he was one of the first folks that I interviewed for the second half of the book, mm -hmm. which are life stories of four Vermonters. Mm -hmm. And he would play f for me his fiddle in his living room. At, at the time, he was 98 years old, wow. uh, legally blind, effectively mm -hmm. deaf, but just a jolly, happy guy with yeah. all kinds of stories about the paper mill that used to be just mm -hmm. down Pesumpsic Street from where he lives up in mm -hmm. the hill in Wilder. And he said, hey, Dave, you want me to play my fiddle for you? <laughs> and I thought, sure, this person who is blind and deaf. Mm -hmm. And he whips out his fiddle, and he just slips into this alternate state of being almost, wow. playing the fiddle perfectly. I mean, it was slightly out of tune, but the notes he played were wonderful. He knew all of these songs by heart, wow. by feel, by memory. He'd been playing them for you know, 90 years. And he played for me just the sweetest music. And then he'd tell me stories and then play a little more and tell me right. stories. So he wasn't a character in the sense of you know, raising Cain down to the gambling right, saloons. Right. But he was just such an interesting person with, of mm -hmm. course, a you know, hundred years worth of stories, most of them about White River area. Yeah, it's, um, it is interesting when they, you know, they have these stories. And, um, so some other character, well, another character you met. Uh, Harold Wright. Awesome uh, guy. Harold, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, White River's former postmaster 
He was the postmaster here in town when they did the big shift. They moved their headquarters from the center of town right along Main Street right. out to a new facility just kind of out in the outskirts right. and became a regional processing center for the mail, right. which isn't intrinsically interesting to me. But well, when you think of it, it became really important for the mail system, the idea that here is a spot right at the intersection or at the junction of two major highways. Let's turn White River Junction into our main processing and sorting station for the Upper Valley. Wow. And he was the man who really helped bring that about and helped them get their facility erected on the outskirts of town. And he was really cool. His uh, son owns a sawmill and operates right across the street. <laughs> so we sat there listening to the buzz saws going in the distance, and he told me stories about his family that had been there since his uh, great, great, great grandfather right. had signed the charter for the town of Hartford. See, I think that is a right who's buried up there. Could in well that be. Cemetery. I think yeah. that, Could when well you said be. right, that's not, I think that, mm -hmm. and I, when I, we first did the video history, I said, nah, well, you know, and I, I didn't know where it was, and I, I mean, they had a picture of it, so I knew mm -hmm. it must be somewhere. Yeah. When I have just drive by and get a hot chocolate at Dunkin' Donuts, it, well, there it is. Mm -hmm. It is not, yeah. it's right in the middle of a major, you know, it's right there, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, they had to work the rolls around there. Yeah. You know, one of the key parts of White River are the buildings. Yes. Uh, I was telling you before we went on the air about this. The woman I talked to yesterday came down and said, I can remember when I was a baby, mm -hmm. then mother used to work here as an accountant at the um, tip-top. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it was the bread factory, but it could have been the but I think the bread factory. Yeah. You've actually had people come down here and say, and walk through here and say, who were with the bread factory? This is, this is where I work. This is, this is where this was right here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in the 70s and 80s now, but, the, you know, they yeah. would just point out where they used to work in the tip-top, you know, and so, you know, this, this tells us about this building right here. Uh, this building here was originally built by the Smith family in the late 1800s. As it, it started as individual buildings for their different endeavors. They had a steam laundry. They had the Smith & Sons Bakery. They rolled cigars and sold cigars and made Dartmouth chocolates, which yeah. the Smith family started doing in the uh, 1840s uh, over in Hanover. And it was Everett Smith who brought the Smith & Sons business over here to White River Junction when he heard about the railroads coming into town. And so this tip-top building that we're in right now started as a whole bunch of little individual buildings. And at one point, uh, the Smith Family Enterprises acquired the Vermont Baking Company, and this became the right. Vermont Baking Company right. right here. So you had the Smith & Sons Bakery, you had the Vermont Baking Company, you had a confectionery, a steam laundry, which became the Vermont Baking uh, Company space. And over the time, they just add more and more little facilities. And when Smith and uh, Sons eventually sold the facility to uh, who was, uh, at that point, the general manager, uh, George C. West, I believe, uh, took it over as the Vermont Baking Company and continued on there, they started enclosing some of the spaces and making this into one really big building. So as you walk through the hallways here, you, you see part of the floor in one of the main hallways used to be a loading dock. And you can look down at where <laughs> these angled pieces of wood intersect a concrete floor, and you realize, wow, this used to be an open space. This interior wall used to keep out the nor'easters. Yeah. This used to be an exterior wall. And then as you close your eyes and just run your fingers along the walls in the tip-top building here, realize that every nick and chip and ding out of the brick tells a story. Right. That was where someone banged a cart or a piece of machinery, yeah. a steel-toed work boot, into the brick. Right. That's all that's left of some people, a tombstone somewhere, and this nick and this chip yeah. from one moment in their life. You can almost read the stories like the grooves in a record. <laughs> I just fell in love with that. Now, the other, of course, the most famous block or buildings mm -hmm. in White River is, are the Brig, is a Briggs block, the, Brig, mm -hmm. the Coolidge Hotel, which I believe is, was, oh, is, oh, is a part of the Briggs family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and Dave Briggs showed me the rooms one time. Mm -hmm. We were doing a show with him, and they're really nice. Yeah. But, um, and that was a part park. He said the people got the train, they went to the Coolidge Inn to mm -hmm. stay overnight. And when I first got here, there's practically, you know, there's, there's Nord stages there, but there's, mm -hmm. it's just, there's a lot to open up there. Tell us oh, about, yeah. about the Briggs Block and Coolidge Hotel. Uh, the Coolidge Hotel is a really fascinating history. It began as a hotel in Enfield, New Hampshire, actually. Mm -hmm. And Colonel Nathaniel Wheeler, again, seeing the potential in the railroad mm -hmm. coming to White River Junction, had the hotel yeah. disassembled board by board and mm -hmm. nail by nail brought across the river over to White River Junction and erected on essentially the site where the Hotel Coolidge is now. Called it the Junction House, open for business, and there you go. Yeah. 
And this was back in the days when your light all came from oil lamps and candles. Everything was wood. And you didn't have fire codes and sprinklers and other yeah. nice modern conveniences. Right. So, of course, that hotel burned down. So they rebuilt a new hotel, and they put it right there. They used bricks this time, and, and that hotel also burned down, and then they rebuilt it yet again. Right. And that, I believe, is the Hotel Coolidge as we see it now, right. a three-story structure where the immediately before that they had four-story structure. Right. So you have a three-story structure, the Hotel Coolidge, named for President Calvin Coolidge, who I actually right. did a report on when I was in middle <laughs> school. Uh, his father would stay here when uh, the Coolidge family right. would come through the area on business. It was named after the Coolidge family, right. after the president himself. Have you been to the Coolidge farm, Sad? I haven't been to the it Coolidge is farm beautiful. yet. beautiful. Yeah. You should go there. It just, maybe not now because of the weather, but in this... Yeah. I can it, snowshoe across yeah, it's it. Yeah. Go it's gorgeous. <laughs> And they make Plymouth cheeses there. And it's oh, just, cool. It's a really gorgeous spot, yeah. That's neat. Yeah, I'd like to get down to Rutland and see the Vermont Common Cracker Company because yeah. they make the Hanover Crackers, right. or what they call Hanover Crackers. They're tiny little things, about yay big. They go great in soup. I had some with my lunch today at the Tucker Box. Yeah. But those are kind of the modern, not really equivalent, but the modern legacy, the great-great-grandchild cracker of right. the Hanover Crackers that were made right here in this building. Right. That, of course, started up in Hanover with the Sims Family Bakery in 1815 mm -hmm. is when the Sims Family opened their shop. Well, of course, this year coming up is Benny Wentworth, 250, year, 250 years ago, was a very busy person. Mm -hmm. He incorporated about 16 towns in one day. Whew. And, you know, what's ironic... Like the Johnny Appleseed of civil planning. But what's ironic, <laughs> and I never thought about this, what's ironic about that? Yeah. And he did this about 250 years ago, so 1650 or something whatever, that, you know, 250 years ago, I can't quickly do the math right now, yeah. is that he found all these 16 towns on July 4th. Hmm. Now, someone said, isn't that interesting? Because he you knows it's July 4th. And, yeah. yeah, so it's interesting. He, they, they found it on July 4th, in, you know, even though the, const, the declaration was affirmed on July 2nd, mm -hmm. but celebrated July 4th. Um, it's interesting how that happened and how yeah. certain numbers and dates in the, in the year always seem to coincide. Mm -hmm. So Hartford and Norwich and Hannah are all going through this 250 celebration. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there's a lot going on in all these towns. Yeah. It's July 4th weekend, July 2nd, and I summer started July 2nd, I know Hannah started July 2nd, 3rd and 4th. So the celebration going all around and um, this Benny Wentworth is looking down on us now, I said, wow, look what I did. Um, <laughs> So I think we always, the time comes to a close, but um, okay. first of all, I just want to thank you for coming, and you have a chance to check out the book, uh, White River Junction. Um, we can't tell you the price because it's non profit but you just, yeah. and you're having a book signing tonight, right? I'm having a book signing. It's uh, going to uh, be... Unfortunately, it's going to be playing this after the fact, but... Yeah, hey, that's fine. I'm giving a talk at the Hotel Coolidge. Dave Briggs is kind enough to be my host for right. that, where I'll be talking about the three major eras in White River's history and how the railroads really built this right. part of the Upper Valley and all yeah. of that. So, yeah. and of course, I'll be introducing folks to my book, which is White River Junctions, with an S on the end of it, right. for all the different ways that White River right. is a junction. And the subtitle is, make sure that I get my own subtitle right, Empires of Flower, Steel, and Ambition. Awesome. For the ways that uh, the Smith family built an empire out yeah. of flour right here on the steel of the rails and the ambition of the Vermont work ethic. And I think, because um, I do love, I'm, I'm a history, as people know, I'm a history, well, I've been a show, a history buff. Yeah is that one way to learn history is to not never, never mind knowing the dates, but understand where, how people lived. I mean, when you yeah. talk about the nick in the, the brick, you know, mm -hmm. why was there a nick there? What happened? To, you know, it's a little piece of history there. Yeah. And if you get a chance to visit White River Junction, it is a great town. It's remodeled itself, but the trains are still here. They used, unfortunately, used to be a train museum down in the, in the the it's not there anymore. I think they closed it. Oh, I remember. It wasn't much, but it was really interesting, crammed was interesting, full yeah. of the old signals they used to have on the side of the yeah. tracks and the lanterns from the headlights. It may still be open. It may be, still, it may be open. I, last I knew it was closed. But um, okay. one thing you can do in the spring of the year that you can take a, a train trip up to mm -hmm. fairly from... I'm sorry, fairly Vermont on, on the tracks. Mm -hmm. And to do that and sort of see you know, how you're driving along and picture yourself 250 years ago or <laughs> more with the trains. Um, so I hope you get a chance to look at White River Junction. And also I'm putting a plug in for the 250 celebrations that are going on both Vermont and New Hampshire. Summer started July 2nd, I said, into this week of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Busy weekend celebrating our independence, but also celebrating the founding of 16 towns that 
Benny Wentworth in one day, so I just said, well, I should incorporate these towns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyways, thank you very much for coming on, Dave. Thanks I for having me, Bob. It. I appreciate and, it. Uh, thank you for watching the CATV show. We hope to be on again shortly. Have a great day.